I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest updates from Ukraine, ask why the West has been slow in arming Kyiv, and we speak to The Telegraph's defence editor, Danielle Sheridan, to catch up after a tumultuous few weeks on the defence beat in the UK. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 25th of July, one year and 151 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley, former tank commander and Telegraph columnist Hamish Bratton Gordon, and our defence editor, Daniel Sheridan. I started by going over the latest news from Ukraine. Air alerts are blared over Kyiv for more than three hours early on Tuesday morning before Iranian-made Shahid drones were downed by air defences. This is coming from uh, Kyiv's authorities. Serhii Popko, the head of Kyiv's military administration, said there were no victims or destruction. The attack marks the sixth assault this month on the capital, which was hit on consecutive nights around the time of the NATO summit two weeks ago. The mayor of Kyiv, Vitaly Klitschko, has called for more anti-drone defences and said more regard should be paid to the city's military requirements, proposing a coordination council made up of local representatives and the Ministry of Defence. In the Black Sea, there's been more reported fighting. The Russian Defence Ministry has claimed that a Russian Black Sea ship destroyed two unmanned Ukrainian naval drones that attempted to attack it overnight. The ministry said that the Sergei Kotov, a patrol ship, had been monitoring shipping in the southwest part of the Black Sea at the time. It opened fire on the drones and destroyed them and apparently was undamaged. There are not believed to have been any casualties. Turning to the counteroffensive, Kyiv has reported small advances in southern Ukraine and to the east near Bakhmut. A spokesman for the general staff said soldiers had advanced in the direction of the southeastern village of Staromayorsky near settlements recaptured last month in Donetsk. Ukrainian forces have also reportedly driven Russian units from positions southwest of Bakhmut near the village of Andrivka. As we've heard before, progress has been slower than expected, but Ukraine has said it is trying to minimise casualties as troops face fortified Russian defensive positions strewn with landmines. Further behind the front lines, an 82-year-old woman has been killed after Russian forces launched dozens of attacks across Zaporizhia. This comes from the regional military administration. It wrote on Telegram, 70 blows were inflicted by the enemy on 19 settlements of the Zafir region over the past day. 21 destructions of residential buildings and infrastructure facilities were recorded. The enemy will bear responsibility for every crime. Down in Kherson, two people were wounded after Russian forces attacked houses and a school. This comes from the region's governor. Oleksandr Prokudin wrote on Telegram, The Russian military aimed at the residential quarters of the populated areas of the region, the life support system of the secondary school, and the commercial premises in Bedeslav district. Due to Russian aggression, two people were injured. Uh, moving up to Donetsk, parents have been urged to evacuate their children after a child was among seven civilians killed by Russian shelling. Regional Governor Pavlo Kirilenko said three girls aged between 5 and 12 and an 11-year-old boy had been wounded in the attack on Kostyantinivka. One of them later succumbed to their injuries. He wrote on Telegram, this is Pavlo Kirilenko, the Russians once again prove that they are at war with civilians, and in their desire to kill, they stop at nothing. I appeal to parents once again, there is no place for children in a war zone. Take care of them. Evacuate. And finally, according to the UN's atomic watchdog, anti-personnel mines have been laid at the site of the Russian-occupied Zafirizhia nuclear power station. Experts from the International Atomic Energy Agency spotted mines located in a buffer zone between the site's internal and external perimeter barriers on a visit on Sunday. The agency chief, who we've heard quite a lot from the last few months, Rafael Grossi, said that the move breached safety standards and nuclear security guidance, but should not affect the site's nuclear safety and security systems. And of course, we'll go to Hamish later on for comment for that. But Francis, can I turn to you first? What's the latest diplomatic and political updates you've been looking at? Well, thank you, David. Off the back of those reports, I think we can glean a sense of Kyiv's anxieties and priorities at this moment from a readout today of a conversation between President Zelensky and the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. 
Ukraine urgently needs to tighten its air defences and continue exporting grain via the Black Sea, Zelensky told Sunak. Writing on social media after their call, he said, We spoke about Russia's daily attempts to destroy Odessa's historic centre and port infrastructure. We must defend Odessa. Ukraine urgently needs to strengthen its air defence to protect its historical heritage and continue the Black Sea Grain Initiative. We discussed our further defence cooperation, the course of Ukrainian offensive operations. I outlined the current defence needs of Ukraine. In response, Sunak said that Britain hopes to restore the Black Sea Grain deal and is carefully monitoring Russian ships on the trade route. Downing Street said in a subsequent statement, the Prime Minister said the UK was working closely with Turkey on restoring the grain deal and we would continue to use our role as chair of the UN Security Council to further condemn Russia's behaviour. Unfortunately, as I said last week, the apparent lack of forward planning over what would happen if Russia pulled out of the grain deal has meant that on the face of it, Western leaders can only express their hope that the deal will be re-agreed during President Erdogan's meeting with Putin this week. But that would surely require concessions on sanctions, which would score a huge political victory for Putin. And Moscow evidently senses Western weakness and equivocation. It is saying no talks are underway on resuming the export arrangement. And the FSB security service has alleged it found traces of explosives on a cargo ship travelling to pick up grain. This unnamed vessel may have been used to deliver explosives to Ukraine, where it had docked two months earlier, according to the service. But surprise, surprise, they didn't offer any evidence of this. At the same time, Russia is pressing home its narrative that NATO is dangerously expanding, their phrase, its involvement in the Ukraine war. Its deputy foreign minister said that the NATO military bloc may be dangerously expanding its involvement in the actions which seriously fuel regional tensions. We view such things as inadmissible. This is political gaslighting, in my view. Russia launched a drone attack on a Ukrainian grain storage facility just 200 metres away from Romania. The Romanian president said the strike on Reni across the Danube River posed serious risks to security of the entire region. And suffice to say, as a member of NATO, if an attack were, by accident or design, to spill over into Romanian territory, it would raise the possibility of dragging the Western military alliance into a wider conflict. Then one looks at what Russia is doing in Belarus. The Poles, as we've talked about, are extremely anxious. And let's say that Wagner mercenaries were, hypothetically, to stage some kind of incursion into Poland. What would NATO's response be? Would that be seen as an attack by Russia or by outside parties? Would it trigger Article 5? These are all essential questions that are being posed at the moment. And I know I bang this drum a lot, so forgive the repetition, but there is nothing that Putin will not do if he's allowed to do it. He operates in the space that is afforded to him. Strategic ambiguity does not work. Only red lines and clear consequences. So I would argue that NATO needs to clearly articulate what its response would be in these scenarios just as it should have arguably done in the case of Moscow pulling out of the grain deal. But it's not all going Russia's way. In other news, Putin has raised the age limit at which Russian reservists can be mobilised to 55 in an apparent attempt to boost troop numbers. A new law signed by the Russian president means high-ranking officers will be eligible to be mobilised up until the age of 55, up from 50 previously, while privates and sergeants can be called up until the age of 40, up from 35. The lower age limit for middle-ranking officers will meanwhile be raised to 50 from 45 previously. The changes, which will be gradually rolled out over a four-year period from 2024 to 28, mean high-ranking officers will eventually be able to serve by law until they are 70. Now, I know many people will hear that and think, well, what's the what change does that make? What difference does that make given the long course of time that will be involved in implementing those changes? But bear in mind, this is also trying to send a political signal to the West that Russia are in this for the long haul. And I'll come to that later. 
Putin's amendments came as part of a legislative drive to close loopholes that have made it relatively easy for Russians to dodge the draft. Russia's parliament is expected to pass a bill today that would raise fines for refusing to show up at the enlistment office after receiving call-up papers. The current fine is around the equivalent of £4, but that could go up to as much as £250. Russians will also have to pay a fine for failing to inform the enlistment office of a change of address or their contact details. On the one hand, it further underlines the humiliation Russia has suffered in what was supposed to be a brief special military operation. On the other, it underscores the challenge Ukraine faces. Russia is seemingly not backing down, knowing that due to Western equivocation and wavering, there is still a chance Kyiv may be forced to the negotiating table if Moscow is seen as being determined to fight this war until it secures a victory come what may. War, as we've talked about, is often measured in numbers of men and materiel. And it was always going to be an uphill struggle on that basis for Kyiv. Thus, the country always needed two things, unflinching Western support, which made it clear to the Russians there is no hope of them holding on, that it would just bleed them dry over many, many years, plus advanced weaponry, which can score decisive strategic victories and potentially encircle and or kill thousands of Russians in decisive military actions. On both, the West has not entirely delivered. Though from an optimist perspective, if one looks at where we were a year ago, it is inching closer, but its hesitancy only plays into Putin's hands. Now, Joe spoke yesterday about the US's hesitancy to send the army tactical missile system, but there are other issues too. Jack Watling of the Royal United Services Institute, and he's written for us in the past as well, has written a piece in The Guardian uh, where he says that what the Ukrainians needed in order to conduct successful offensive operations was clearly communicated to Western capitals last year. The priorities being artillery, engineering capability, tactical air defence, protective mobility and collective and staff training. Of these, Ukraine's partners have provided sufficient artillery and protected mobility. Engineering and tactical air defences, however, have been less forthcoming. Collective and staff training have been slow to be set up, with Ukraine's partners prioritising training individual Ukrainian soldiers. And he goes on. Another problem is that much of the training provided has been poorly designed. Individual soldiers can be trained in Ukraine. What cannot be easily done there, with Ukraine's training grounds target for Russian strikes, is unit training above the company. For this reason, collective training has been organised on European training grounds for some Ukrainian units. However, Western forces have a mantra that you should train as you fight. Ukrainian troops have been clear that they have not been able to do this on Western tri training areas. They have not been able to fly their UAVs because of regulatory constraints or use of their own fire control software because it is not certified by NATO. Perhaps the biggest problem is the regulations have been rigid in requiring us to teach Ukrainians how we do business without there being adequate time to actually deliver all the relevant modules. Collectively, all these bureaucratic constraints highlight a serious problem for Ukraine's partners. While not actually fighting a war, the future of Ukrainian security depends upon the outcome of this struggle and Europe's. And yet Western capitals continue to be process driven and slow, applying peacetime approaches to much of their activity. Western militaries have made progress in adapting their practice since the start of the war. The rest of government has been slower to realise what must be done. So anyway, that's the lay of the land in the political context, David, although there's a lot of overlap with, with military at the moment for obvious reasons. Thank you very much, Francis. Well, let's go to a former military man that we trust, Hamish de Breton Gordon. And there's an awful lot here to comment on. Would you like to start just by giving your thoughts on Jack Watling's piece in The Guardian? I thought Francis laid out some of the issues there uh, very eloquently. What are your thoughts? Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I think Jack's done a really good job in his piece today. I'll ju just step back to something that Francis was talking about uh, slightly earlier on. <clears throat> the strategic ambiguity that Putin is using to his best effect. I think it really, the whole reason for it is sort of explained by the whole reason of, of Jack's piece and everything else. NATO got involved earlier on, but it is sort of being in dribs and drabs and it's been 
each thing that comes is is really difficult. Each time Zelensky wants something, be it tanks or aircraft, it's taken an awful lot of time. And to me, it's it's the sort of the dilemma between politics and military operations. And I I, I always remember when I, when I was still a serving officer, the great frustration for the military people is, of course, politicians are making the decisions. But a politician makes a decision at the last safe moment. A military person takes the decision as soon as possible. And therefore, you've got this dilemma that where a military person wants his F-16s now, but politicians want to make the decision to give F-16s at the last safe moment. And these sort of things don't sort of work together. And then that comes on to the whole piece of training, getting getting the Ukrainian troops fit to fight or as fit as they possibly can. And again, this sort of goes back to the political piece. There are so many competing issues, I think, across Europe and for the states at the moment that although we and and people in Ukraine and, and around Ukraine are living it day to day, there are other things that, that people are making decisions on. And I, I think NATO has got out of the habit of operating in this sort of military operational context and its decision making is painfully slow but again it's completely taking its guide from its political masters in whichever country that they come from so to me and and when jack is talking about regulatory problems and not being able to use uavs in training areas in europe i mean that that is just bonkers it is crass it is almost that some politicians in, in, in europe think think this is going to go away. Ultimately, NATO and Europe and the US cannot afford Ukraine to fail. And up until this moment, they have been giving them the hardware and the software to make it happen. But as as Jack is pointing out, that is not happening at a pace that we would think. Now, I put my military hat back on and, and you know, having been in, in armored operations in the first Gulf War uh, and other wars, yeah, I I can absolutely see myself uh, and those Ukrainian tank commanders approaching these massive defensive lines and working out how you get through it. And absolutely, you need to train to do it. And you need to train with all the capability that you have. And attacking is always going to be difficult. But from a Ukraine's perspective, they need to be unconstrained. To me, they're sort of fighting with one hand behind their back. For this to be successful as quickly as possible, they need attackums. You know, they need as much high Mars, as much storm shadow as they can get. They need air cover. They need air parity at least where the S-16s come in, if it is going to happen in a timely fashion. Now, I think NATO is going to look back on this, hopefully sooner rather than later, and see that it should have made decisions and committed. Because if Ukraine does not prevail itself, at some stage... You know, NATO could get embroiled. And you're talking about the attack 200 metres from Romania yesterday. I wrote a piece in the paper uh, yesterday about uh, the Prigozhin and the Wagner threat to attack into Poland. And perhaps we'll come back to that. So, by almost by accident, NATO could become involved ed- anyway. And I'm not entirely convinced. NATO and particularly the main players in it, you know, are are absolutely united on on, on how they can go forward and make decisions. But but again, again, coming back to the the piece that you asked me to comment on, Jack Watling's piece, I would say that I'm slightly more upbeat than Jack is, having been through this whole system myself and done it for twenty or thirty years, and I quite get why Ukraine is is shouting for everything because they need it. But it is a slow process. I mean, the the border between the Ukrainian and Russian forces is absolutely massive. I would point, I mentioned Bakhmut in, in France's piece. You know, I, I think Bakhmut could be a really critical area here. Uh, and I, I think the Wagner group are, are hacked off with a whole lot of things, not least the fact that the Russian conscripts are, are capitulating rather more quickly than Wagner would hope. And Wagner thought fought for Bakhmut for 10 months, and in 10 weeks it looks like it's all going backwards. So so there are a lot of issues here. I would hope that um, the people like Ben Wallace, our defence minister, he's absolutely on it. I mean, he, he is one of the few 
senior politicians who I expect really understands the, the blood and guts of this sort of stuff. Um, and I hope that his his voice in the last few months he's around w- will be heard because you know we need to take that hand from behind Ukraine's back to allow them to get in and prosecute the most challenging operation that any army is ever going to do against a not a very capable, I'd say, Russian military force on the ground, but one in huge numbers and one in position rather, I expect, than uh, than turn and run. So I'll, I'll stop there for a breath and, and questions. Thank you very much for that, Hamish. Hamish, could I ask you just to, well, it'd be great to get your thoughts on the counteroffensive in general. I mean, in my news update from the front lines at the top of this podcast, we spoke about something, you know, a refrain we've been hearing for weeks now, sort of incremental slow advances around Bakhmut and in the south. Um, and there's been quite a lot of reporting across certainly quite a lot of the Western press. I've seen it elsewhere as well that, and you know, regular listeners will of course have heard this, that the counteroffensive is is progressing a lot slower than people hoped. When you're looking over the past few months, has anything surprised you about what you've seen? And are you still optimistic? And if so, why? I think to absolutely start with, yes, I am optimistic. When we consider only about 20% of the Ukraine military is has been committed uh, and the, the real punch is yet to come, they are fighting on a massive front line. I mean, that 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 is absolutely evident. And I think that is hugely challenging. Which is why, you know, not having all the capability that they need must be very, very frustrating for the Ukraine high command. I think Francis and Jack have picked up a bit about the engineering capability. You know, it's fighter jets and tanks are what get the headlines, but actually it's that um, something called a giant viper, which is a big explosive coil that we use to blow up minefields, uh, mine plows on tanks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Are, are really critical to enable manoeuvre. And it would appear that they have not got there in the numbers that one would expect. And I, I find it a bit surprising because although we weren't using tanks in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, the UK and the US and others invested massively in uh, armoured vehicles that, that could deal with minefields and mines and stuff. Uh, and I'm rather surprised we haven't seen some of them but again, it, with, without the right air defence in place, it makes it very difficult. So I think, and, and occasionally one hears where, where there is a bit of a, a break in the front line and one just waiting to see when it's going to be reinforced. So yeah, it, it's taking time and it's really hard yards. But I also look at the punishment that the Russian forces are getting on the ground. I mean, they are dying in vast numbers. We discussed last week that those vast numbers, up to 150,000 Russian dead, is now being reported in Russia. And the point about hiring conscription age and all the rest of it, again, is is really acknowledging the fact that they are getting low on manpower. And this manpower is pretty much untrained manpower. So the Russians have had time to build some very sophisticated defences. I think we, hopefully, we will make sure that Ukraine get all the engineering kit they need to get through them uh, and all the explosive kit like John Viper and elsewhere. And perhaps there are a few munitions that, like the, um, the the fuel air, the mixture bombs and they call daisy cutters and stuff, which again would help to get through those minefields. I still feel that in the next couple of weeks or month or so, they will get a big breakthrough. And I think once they get behind the lines, and um, I was discussing this elsewhere yesterday, they have prepared so much of the deep battle, the, the ammo dumps, the fuel dumps in Crimea and elsewhere, and, and the infrastructure and logistics, Kirsch Bridge, that, that actually, and the other point that Jack makes, that they have very little in reserve. There's no strategic reserve charging around the place. So not to call it a thin red line, but, but although... The defensive positions are very comprehensive you know, and led to a degree. Once you get through that sort of 10Ks worth of defensive positions in depth, I don't think there's much to prevent them. So, yeah, that's a very long way of saying it's it's really difficult. They are making progress. And at some stage, they will hit that dam, hit the crack in it and burst through. I'm still confident of that. 
Thanks, Hamish. That's re- it's really fascinating to hear your thoughts on this as we've been coming back to this topic you know, ag- again and again as more news comes out. Uh, just a couple more things I think would be interesting to hear your thoughts on. One of the reasons I think you're such an interesting contributor is your experience in Syria and seeing the impact of Russian forces and what they did there. What were your thoughts then to link that to the recent attack on the cathedral in Odessa? Yes, I was especially disappointed, but it was sort of going to happen. It's such a it's such a dreadful thing to do. I mean, Putin and Lukashenko were only pictured today, you know, being blessed in a cathedral. They're supposed to be religious people. And it really goes to the heart of things. This is straight out of the Syrian playbook. Now, the rules of war, the Geneva Conventions, state that certain sites are protected and combatants should not go in them and should not try and destroy them. And those sites are religious sites, churches, mosques, synagogues, hospitals, schools, sites of historic interest. And everybody will remember the Paralimni be being devastated by the by the Syrians and the Russians in Syria, one of the, the most important ecological sites on the globe. But the the mechanism which should happen and did happen in Syria was that each side would make sure that the United Nations knew where these vital sites were. And, you know, for our hospitals in Syria, we'd give a grid reference. It became very clear, uh, and the idea is that the UN would then tell the Syrians and the Russians where these hospitals were, and they were protected and shouldn't fire their missiles at them. But invariably, 48 hours after passing this information, those hospitals were hit with precision-guided missiles. On this whole thing that I've discussed and written about before this sort of unconventional violence and the materiel of modern conflict, that there are no limits. There is no off piece. So attacking a UNESCO world site is, is exactly in the playbook. And, you know, Russians seem to think by doing that, they're going to bring things down. But I think it, it's the, the wider piece of this is also attacking the grain um, and, and destroying grain, which... Uh, I was amazed. Reports in the Telegraph yesterday about uh, Putin talking to his African followers about you know how he's going to help and support them. At the same time, he's destroying all the grain that's destined to them at a price that they can afford. So, yeah, it, it is continued to roll out and super cynical. And whether this has happened in this case, as in passing of information between the sides, I don't know. But something like the cathedral at Odessa would be very easy to identify and very easy to miss. I mean, it seems absolutely clear that this was a deliberate attack. And it's another war crime to add to the growing list, along with the attacking and destroying grain. And perhaps we, we will touch on the grain if we've got a minute as well. Absolutely. Just finally, before we go back to Francis for any thoughts and comments, Hamish, uh, your thoughts again, I mean, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has been a focus of your interest for the past a year and a half. Today we had the news that anti-personnel mines have been spotted, reported by the International Atomic Energy Agency. What's your take on that? Well, I, I don't. Th- I don't think anybody's particularly surprised. And um, yeah, of course, it, as Senor Grossi says, this is not ideal. The, the, uh, and again, the rules of war would have you not fighting around nuclear power stations or or, or anywhere that could create harm to civilians. So, it is. Not unexpected. I think the real concern is what has not been inspected. We know that the IEA inspectors have not been in in the reactor buildings. The Ukrainian intelligence suggested some time ago that they were wired for explosives. Now, we don't know that. And I think the Russians are are using Zaporizhia very much as as a threat and a weapon of war. Uh, we've discussed before why I think it's strategically important because, again, it could cut off vast swathes to the west of Ukraine where the Ukraine forces could operate. And although 99.9% of people in the world believe that nobody could be as evil to blow up a nuclear power station, well, we, we, we look at the dam, which, which of course creates the greatest ecological disaster we're likely to see in, in Europe for some time. So, yeah, it, it's. It, I think it, it, it is absolutely, again, part of the playbook that, that Russian is doing. 
nobody should be fighting around a nuclear power station. I, th- I think in one way it also it helps Russia block the front because I think they're assuming that that um, Ukrainian tanks are not going to charge through Zaporizhia nuclear power station, which I'm sure they wouldn't do. Uh, and in a way, that provides a bit of protection. Uh, and of course, ultimately, if everything goes desperately wrong, the Russians could use it as some sort of improvised weapon. But yeah, I think Zaporizhia nuclear power station we're going to be talking about until this war is over. Thanks, Hamish. It might be useful now, actually, just to read out a couple of quotes from the IAEA's recent statement where they announced the the detection of these anti-personnel mines. They said, in recent days and weeks, the IAEA experts present at the ZNPP have carried out inspections and regular walkdowns across the site without seeing any heavy military equipment. The IAEA is also continuing to request access to the roofs of the ZNPP's reactors and their turbine halls, including Units 3 and 4, which are of particular interest Earlier today, I think this is on the 23rd, the experts visited the reactor unit 6, main control room, emergency control room, the rooms where electrical cabinets of the safety systems are located and parts of the turbine hall where they saw the main feed water pumps, main turbine oil tank and main condenser. While the team was not able to visit all areas in the turbine hall, they did not observe any mines or explosives. So that's just uh, some more context, I think, from the IAEA, uh, just to what Hamish was speaking about there. Francis Turnley, can I come to you? Um, any thoughts or questions on any of that? Well, just on the issue of UNESCO World Heritage Sites being blown up, I know that some people will say, well, this is just an inevitable consequence of war. And they'll immediately cite examples in the 20th century of where famous historical sites were destroyed in conflict, sometimes by Western powers. And so I think they will, in a way, just sort of shrug their shoulders and dismiss it. But I just think It's important to remember, and I know Dom has made this point in the past as well, that we are meant to be living in a different world now where the horrors of the 20th century are not permitted, that rules of war were established that ensured these sites were not destroyed, as Hamish just said. And so I just want to underline that point, that this isn't meant to be possible anymore in the moral architecture that was built out of the ashes of the horrors of the 20th century. We don't want to see a reversion to that. And yet, unfortunately, the manner in which Russia has deployed itself and fought this war has seen a reversion to that, which is why, of course, the war in Ukraine is so important and victory for Kyiv is so important, because if we enable that kind of behaviour, do we also encourage its spread in how the world fights wars? This is what is at stake there. It is more than just positions on a map. It's a it's a moral war as well in terms of the the universe that we inhabit and how we think about war and how war should be fought. But anyway, I digress. There was actually another story, David, I wanted to report on, which speaks to the moral morality theme. And it's coming from Ukraine. It's a major story there that's been reported all over their press. And that it's a former Ukrainian military official accepted bribes in order to help men escape mobilization. And that's coming from authorities who've claimed to charge him with corruption. His arrest comes amid allegations that his family has amassed millions of pounds worth of real estate in Spain. So The background to this is that yesterday on Monday, Ukraine State Bureau of Investigations, the SBI, an institution, of course, we've spoken a lot about in the past, arrested Yevhen Borisov, who was in charge of mobilization and conscription in the Odessa region until he was fired last month. The SBI, who typically handle high profile crimes, said that the individual was detained in Kyiv before he tried to flee the country. I should say that hasn't been independently verified. Apparently, the investigation into Mr. Borisov was launched following a damning investigation by the Ukrainian media outlet Pravda that alleged the conscription chief and his family bought luxurious real estate in Spain and several sports cars after the start of the invasion. He's publicly denied these um, allegations, but he's expected to face a hearing on Tuesday and his suspected crime is considered grave enough to rule out a possible release on bail. And if he's convicted, he could face up to 10 years in prison. I mention this because, as I say, it's an important story in the context of this war. On the one hand, you'll find people who point to this and say, you see, Ukraine is a corrupt country and will use this as evidence as to why they should not be supported by the West. Yet it's important, I think, to underline that a truly institutionally corrupt country would never see this reported or 
tackled in this high profile and uh, frank manner. Evidently, as we've talked about in the past, there is a serious attempt by the Zelensky government to stamp out this sort of behaviour, which was more institutional. They know, as we've discussed before, the importance of this for Ukraine's international perception, as well as for erasing malign incidents from the state as part of its broader project to westernise. This war is being used as a crusade in many ways to cleanse the Ukrainian political system of the hallmarks of the old Soviet corruption model, which haunted it for many decades. And we've, again, interviewed many Ukrainians, including government officials, on that very subject. So it's one of those stories, David, I just want to mention, because I know that some people will look at it the fact that we don't report every single instance of a corruption story. And so that's evidence that we're part of some grand conspiracy to conceal the truth. Far from it. We are reporting on it when these stories emerge, but it really can be seen as either a good or a bad story, depending on what your already pre-standing view on Ukraine is. But I think it's undeniable that Kyiv is seeking to try and stamp out this sort of behaviour and is public about the fact that it is doing so. And I think that is revealing in and of itself. Thank you very much, Francis. Any more updates from either of you before we go to our final thoughts? Just a quick one on, on the brain deal that Francis mentioned at the very beginning. I was having a few chats to various people who know about these things earlier on today, and, and I wrote a piece on Friday in the paper about it. I think what one thing that, that is not being really looked at is whether NATO or the international community could provide some sort of protection to these grain ships going through the Black Sea. Now, in, in theory, Romania, Bulgaria, or Turkey um, that has a Black Sea coast and has a navy could provide that protection because it's in international waters. Most of it, in fact, they, they don't need to go near any Russian waters or even Russian claim waters around the Crimea. And it strikes me that this is such an important issue that it should be looking at that. Somebody suggested to me this, this morning that or, you know NATO might be unpalatable to have ships in the Black Sea confronting the uh, Russian Black Sea fleet. However, India, that seems to be so firmly sitting on the fence in this conflict and has a massive navy and has a big requirement for Ukraine grain might be persuaded to get involved so that these ships can carry on. But you know, Putin needs to needs to be really leaned on to get this going because we're seeing the price. I think it was, I think uh, Prime Minister Sunak mentioned it today that this was going to have a real adverse effect you know, just on the UK cost of living, quite apart from having a des- devastating effect, effect in Africa and elsewhere. So it's one of those things that I, the international community, Na- NATO, but ideally a UN-sponsored um, uh, piece should should go in to get this grain flowing again. Um, and, I, and I'm hoping that that is what Sunak's been discussing with various people around the world in the last uh, 24 hours. Thank you very much, Hamish. Francis, would you like to go first with your final thought? Thanks, David. I just left a meeting with some influential figures. I won't name them. And I sense there is an increased pessimism on the issue of Ukraine, which I think we've touched on today. It is easy to see why. They look at the counteroffensive and fear a frozen conflict. They see Putin's mobilizations and fear its implications. Yet I would argue that many assume too readily that Putin is secure, that Russia remains stable and can do what it pleases without fear of serious internal strife, that only the West wobbles, part of the nature of democracies, whereas autocracies remain strong, which is, of course, part of the image they project, even though it's usually the complete opposite of that fact. I think we need to question that enduring assumption about Putin's regime. After all, it's only been a matter of weeks since a mutiny of Wagner forces. And I disagree with those who argue that he came out of that stronger. So I wanted to end today with a piece by Michael Weiss in The Insider, which just underlines the degree of disaffection within the Russian security apparatus. As he puts it, Bregusian's coup left everyone in the world stunned except Russian intelligence officials, some of whom tacitly supported the catering magnet's efforts. Sources in the FSB, GRU and Ministry of Internal Affairs explained to us 
why Putin's security apparatus failed to stop Wagner from seizing a key military base and charging all the way to the gates of Moscow. It's a detailed piece, but in essence, it cites some Russian spies and soldiers and they're saying that the biggest shock from the abortive coup is that Prigozhin didn't actually succeed in overthrowing the regime. Uh, that they say carries little devotion. They insist Prigozhin faced little resistance because he enjoys widespread support within the ranks of the very institutions meant to safeguard the state. One high-ranking source in the main directorate of the general staff uh, previously warned the insider that a coup attempt was possible in light of Russia's war in Ukraine. The only unexpected development, which he talks about in the piece, was the timing and architect of this one. And I'll quote from him. Everyone in the Ministry of Defence and in the government as a whole is already tired of this war and would like to stop it. You can feel the discontent. So I expected something similar would happen by autumn. The fact that Prigozhin turned out to be at the head of the rebellion was surprising. But he would never have done such a thing if he had not understood that there would be some in the GRU leadership who would support him. Now, my own view is that uh, it was always unlikely Putin would be toppled by Prigozhin. He was considered too much of a maverick by the elite whose support he required. Likewise, the Russian people were not ripe for revolt. But investigations like this and other similar reports should, I would posit, make us continue to question the idea that Putin can do what he likes with impunity. He is also a prisoner of events, a prisoner of this war as he has defined it. Yet, as many believe, if it looks likely he is threatened, then it is entirely possible that he would withdraw. So far from that being impossible in the long term, it may even be the most likely outcome. And so we shouldn't forget that. Dictators always, always appear stronger than they are. They appear ironclad until they aren't. And when that becomes obvious, their downfall is always very sudden indeed. Thank you, Francis. Uh, and finally, Hamish de Breton Gordon. I, I absolutely reiterate what Francis says. You know, the fact that Prigozhin is still waltzing around Russia and Belarus and Putin's only ally appears to be Lukashenko. Um, Again, somebody who knows a lot about these things was mentioning to me only last night that um, wouldn't be surprised to see the jackals in the Kremlin devouring themselves. And I agree that um, you know Putin might well find that the only tenable way out is to leave. And the only thing I'd said, you know, let's hope that happens sooner rather than later. And it will happen sooner if NATO goes all in. I don't mean goes all in, you know, gets troops on the ground, boots on the ground in Ukraine, but goes all in with its support, be it equipment, be it fighters, be it intelligence, and uh, and those politicians that are ruling those NATO countries go all in as well. Because if we're still in this position in this time next year, then it, it could be a completely different world that we're looking at. And uh, we must ensure and enable that this thing does get over as quickly as possible. And Putin goes, and quite frankly, all this talk about whoever's going to come next is going to be worse. Again, I, I think that's an irrelevance. They might well be worse, but they at least will have a position to recheck and recock. And they just won't have that capability to do what Putin's done in the last 14 months. And I think eventually, yeah, and there are signs of it, you know, Medusa independent news site in Russia are, are beginning to report these massive casualties and the disgruntlement. There was even a a, a, a sort of parade, the, I think it was yesterday in, in Moscow against the war. So things, hopefully, a bit like the breach for the counteroffensive will break soon. Similarly, the political breach in, in the Kremlin in Moscow, I hope, will break soon. And I hope that in the autumn we're not still talking along the same lines. The last few weeks has been an extremely busy one on the defence brief at The Telegraph, from Ben Wallace announcing that he will leave the government at the next cabinet reshuffle to the publication of a new command paper, I caught up with Danielle Sheridan, the Telegraph's defence editor, to go over these developments and try and understand the impact of the war on Ukraine on British defence policy. 
Here's our conversation. Well, Danny Sheridan, it's been a big few weeks for defence in the UK. Can we start by talking about the resignation of Ben Wallace, the British Defence Secretary? Did that news take you by surprise? And what does his resignation mean for Ukraine? Hi, David. Thanks for having me. The resignation of Ben Wallace didn't come so much as a surprise. There had been mounting speculation since he didn't get the top job at NATO that he was going to let the Prime Minister know that his days as Defence Secretary were numbered. I think you can't really go around saying you'd love to become the next NATO Secretary General, be so kind of enthusiastic about that and then to not get it and stay in the same job, it kind of seems quite untenable. So people knew that this was happening, that it was in the pipeline and at the Rusi land warfare conference in the days before he announced his resignation, all the military people gathered were saying it was all they were hearing, that Ben Wallace was on his way out. And we don't yet know who will replace him. There are a number of contenders Ben Wallace has made it very clear he would like James Heapy, the Armed Forces Minister, to replace him. The two have worked very closely in government together. Heapy reports directly to Wallace everything regarding Ukraine they've basically worked on together. So in terms of a continuity plan, Heapy would be the right person. However, it isn't Ben Wallace's decision, it's Rishi Sunak's. And as myself and other colleagues are hearing, he is considering a number of people for the role. Penny Morden has been discussed. Now, she served as Defence Secretary, I think, for six weeks, but she lost her job when Boris Johnson was made Prime Minister. He reshuffled her. So she's obviously got unfinished business in the department. Penny Morden's, of course, who our international listeners will know, is the woman with a massive sword from the King's coronation. And then other names include James Cleverley, the Foreign Secretary, and Tom Tugendhat, who it would be interesting if he did come in having not actually worked in the Defence Department in any capacity before. But we don't yet know who will come in, so it is an exciting moment in politics. And certainly because of the war in Ukraine, having a Defence Secretary who is aligned with the principles that the UK has set out, you know, supporting Ukraine no matter what, is incredibly important. So whoever gets the position of Defence Secretary, all eyes will be on how they approach Ukraine going forward. Ben Wallace has obviously been a huge supporter of the country. He's publicly denounced Putin on a number of occasions and whispers in Westminster suggested that Wallace and Rishi Sunak didn't necessarily see eye to eye on everything regarding Ukraine and defence spending as a whole. But it will be really important who does take the reins next, particularly in how they continue to have some element of influence on how the UK continues to support Ukraine as this war shows no sign of slowing. Just looking back over Ben Wallace's time as as Defence Secretary, you mentioned his close working relationship with Alexei Reznikov, his Ukrainian counterpart. Have you got anything from the Ukrainians? Do we know how the Ukrainians are feeling about this? Because, of course, uh, one of the last things Wallace made the news for was that we could call it a gaffe, really, at the summit, where he said, you know, people thought that the Ukrainians should be more... uh, more grateful for the aid they'd received. I mean, what, you know, his point was more nuanced than that, but that's that was the headline. What reaction do we have from the Ukrainian side? Ben Wallace's gaffe, it, it was a schoolboy error. I mean, it didn't go down well at all. Ukraine has been incredibly grateful for the help it has received. Zelensky flew under the cover of darkness to England where he could stand in Westminster and shake Rishi Sunak's hand and thank him for all their help. I think that he has been, as a politician and a leader, incredibly humble and grateful as to what nations have given him. However, it isn't enough. And if he wants to have a victory, he must keep asking for more. And to have Ben Wallace from the comfort of his own non-invaded country to say that he should be more grateful understandably caused a lot of anger and didn't go down well but one wonders Wallace had already announced his resignation he's a bit of a free man now he can talk a lot more liberally so perhaps he didn't feel like he needed to hold back and I sensed an element of frustration in those comments however nuanced they might have been Ukraine since this invasion has 
begun, it's just faced so much upheaval from the UK side of politics. Zelensky had a brilliant relationship with Boris Johnson and then Boris Johnson got kicked out. <laughs> uh, he's now having to develop a relationship with Rishi Sunak. I just, before I came over here, there was a readout from Zelensky's phone call with Rishi Sunak um, most recently that um, number 10 sent round. You know, for all the readouts we get saying these talks are really encouraging, for all the tweets we see, the photographs we see, who really knows what is going on behind closed doors? And I suspect that there is an element, in fact, I know from people I speak to, there is an element of concern as to how long the UK is going to keep supporting this war-torn nation when there seems to be such a quick turnaround in government. So not only have we seen our new prime minister, the most important politician in our country, be replaced, we're now seeing a new MP who you know, resides over the defence of this realm being replaced. I do wonder why, when Wallace has spoken so much about the need for continuity, he would not try and you know, cling on in this role for longer, given the nature of the war, it's showing no sign of slowing. Who knows um, what his answer is behind that. But certainly, there is concern that these kind of leading figures who had really, you know, stuck by Ukraine, demanded we keep on giving weapons, we keep giving more money, we keep training their personnel. These people that were so vocal are slowly leaving and there is concern who will be next and will they still preside over that support. That's fascinating. Thanks, Danny. Can we talk a little bit about the impact the war in Ukraine and the way it's gone has had on how military planners in the UK have been thinking about warfare and about our own armed forces? I think it's an an interesting angle to interrogate slightly. We've had a new command paper. Just explain to our listeners what that is and how the war has changed what's in it. So back in 2021, we had the Integrative Review of Defence and Foreign Policy, and this set out the future of the armed forces, both domestically and abroad. And it said that Russia was a threat, but it said that the biggest threat the UK and the West faced was China. So there was this big focus on the Indo-Pacific tilt. And um, I think I probably mentioned it on this podcast before, there was a very famous... uh, select committee Boris Johnson appeared at where he said, you know, gone are the days where we're going to see tanks rolling across land and invading another nation's territory. Well, how wrong he was. And that possibility wasn't really reflected in the 2021 paper. So we had the IR, the Integrated Review, and then supplementary to that was the command paper that kind of set out all the IR's thinkings in terms of proper stats and figures and new gadgets and all the paraphernalia that goes along with creating our armed forces. So then when Russia invaded Ukraine, they decided to refresh what was originally published in 2021 to kind of reflect on this. The thing is, a lot of criticism was directed towards the command paper because it didn't make any kind of major announcements in light of such a devastating war that is currently taking place. You know, it didn't reverse the troop cuts it originally set out in 2021, which some thought might, and in fact, Labour have pledged to reverse the troop cuts in light of the war. And it still said that the Indo-Pacific tilt stands and China remains our, our biggest enemy, and that there needs to be a lot of concentration towards the Indo-Pacific. So, I mean, there was a big focus on the less sexy ideas. So um, ensuring spares, things to maintain weapons and kit are in proper use so that, for example, if we are donating kit to Ukraine and want it to be extracted so that it can be properly maintained and reused in another capacity, we have the infrastructure around that to do so. So quite boring, quite nitty gritty, but nonetheless important. However, there are a lot of people left scratching their heads thinking, well, what does this actually tell us since the invasion began? You know, I think most people really did want to see a reverse to troop cuts. A key word in 2021 was agility. And that remained a really important word in the refresh. The MOD, the Ministry of Defence's kind of main argument is that fighting today, we need to have lightweight 
agile forces who were ready to go at a moment's notice. Now, that was decided before the invasion, and it's a point that remains today. And there was a lot more of a focus on kind of like drone warfare, as we've seen in Ukraine. I mean, how much of this war is being fought on drones and you've got people I've interviewed people that once upon a time were using drones to film weddings and now they're on the front line tracking down Russians with drones that had literally been capturing a bride and groom saying I do so the importance of drone warfare cannot be understated and that was pushed in the command paper I mean I'm yet to do a control f and see like how many times the word drone AI is used in the latest paper compared to 2021 but it was significant and I do think that was probably the main takeaway is that AI and cyber is going to be, you know, one of the main ways that we do fight wars in the future with a heavy caveat that tanks and soldiers are still really important. That's really fascinating. Thanks, Danny. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Just throwing your eye back over you know, the past six months, a year's worth of defence reporting you've done? I think um, just seeing the attack in Odessa the other day was really striking for me because I think it was this time last year I was in Odessa and it was always the kind of peaceful hub. Um, I have friends from Odessa who are absolutely devastated at what's happened. Luckily, their friends and families that still live there are are fine. But when I was reporting there, it felt like a really cool city. You know, we'd finished writing for the day and I remember going in the hotel we were staying at. We would go upstairs and sit on this rooftop and you could have Negronis and there was a DJ. And it was kind of like, how is this place at war when this is the lifestyle? And I would go for a run sometimes, not often. But if I went for a run... It felt perfectly safe um, to do so. And I think it just, to me, really served as a stark reminder that this country is at war. And whilst the Ukrainians have the most incredible spirit and committing to having a sense of normality, we mustn't take it for granted because it can just be destroyed at any moment. Danny Sheridan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. We'll sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine The Latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Louisa Wells, and the executive producers were David Knowles and Louisa Wells.